So I didn't want to do the uh, uh, introductions. I wanted you to sort of uh, introduce yourself. Why don't you take it on and just tell us a little bit about who you are and what is Beirut by Dyke? Okay. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the invitation and for creating this space. I hope everyone here understands how important this is. I could never have dreamed of taking a course like that uh, at AUB uh, when I was in your place. Um, so my name is Sinin, and as you must have guessed by now, I'm queer and have been out for about 15 years now. Um, what you also need to know is that I, <laughs> I had to come out three times in my life for it to actually work. So the first time was when I was 15, uh, I fell in love with my best friend, of course, and I confronted my family about it. And of course, also I got the response that it was just a phase. And the second time when I was 19, my best friend became my partner and I kind of put it in their face to say, you know, we're together. And, and I was raised by a single mother, as those of you who follow the page already know. Um, and then I realized in my mid twenties, that actually everything I had been doing since the second time I had to come out was kind of unconsciously overcompensating for what I felt was like a defect in my personality. So, and this is when I started the page by, by Dyke because back then I was coming to terms with my own sexuality and I cut my hair and I suddenly started uh, registering as queer for other people. And that completely changed my world, uh, shifted it completely because, you know, suddenly trips to the supermarket or the mukhtar or the laham or the whatever became very, very different. So before I was, I would present my uh, gender in a more feminine way. Everyone was very nice to me. And then, you know, I would kind of be subjected to these microaggressions every single day. So when I realized first the gap between what I wanted to do uh, which was storytelling and what I was actually doing, which is, uh, you know, I was teaching at AUB, I was a career counselor, and this is where we met Sarah. I realized that, you know, uh, something about my life had to change. And so I decided to do Beirut by Dyke uh, to basically tell those stories of microaggression that I felt, um, you know, weren't um, present for me and I actually needed them. So I decided to come up with those stories myself. I can tell you more later on about, you know, what inspired me inspired me to do that because also at the time digitally things were happening that kind of cushioned my ability to do that. Um, so when I'm saying stories, what I mean are daily things like, okay, uh, what happens when I go to the airport to pick up my partner and I can't kiss her? Or um, what happens when we want to go for like a romantic weekend getaway and the hotel receptionist is a bit too curious? Or what happened, or what do I tell a gynecologist who asks me if lesbians have real sex? Um, so these stories I felt were kind of, that was my reality and yet it wasn't represented. So I really needed to tell those stories really, really, really from a very self-centered um, need for catharsis and validation. Uh, so I didn't really did not have like a visual strategy or, um, or anything of the sort that maybe I, I kind of got more recently. So let me, so I think that by now uh, you guys must have received some readings. So I would like to kind of zoom in on one of the scenes. I think that it captures very well um, what I'm trying to do with this page, uh, which, is, which is really a reflection um, on embodiment and space and representation. Uh, so I wrote this about two years ago in Beirut. So we are, as I write, sitting in the back of our little cemented terrace under an umbrella that gives us shade and a sense of improvised privacy in the crowded street leading to the Jesuit garden in Jumel. We are surrounded by three imposing academia trees, which in all their beauty do very little to shield our windows from the watchful eye of the neighbor above us. Bay is putting off sending a tough email to my right by rolling another cigarette. He is sleeping to my left and Bubu the cat is sitting by the shutters in front of me, ontologically contemplating the other neighbor's placid neglect of a barking dog. Cars are honking outside over a parking space or a belated de delivery, but base plants are beginning to climb the wooden ladder inside that Madame Antoinette, the landlord, graciously left us. This 70-year-old ground floor house in all its infrastructure imperfections and neighboring misogyny is quickly beginning to feel like a haven in and away from the city. 
I only wish our love would not be so threatening to the gaze of those who have known violence. So here, I think, um, you know, what I'm trying to do in this comic, for example, and we can later have a discussion about this, but what I'm trying to do is um, really represent this constant push and pull that is experienced by us as queer folks uh, trying to live together in Beirut. So you constantly have this um, overstimulation of the senses outside, right? The noises, the smells, the neighbors, the always the potential violence that is just waiting around the corner. That is, so this outside world that is really constantly penetrating this inside more private world that we are trying to build as some kind of a queer uh, little family, right? With pets. So in this comic, for example, I do that through the use of um, photography and comics. So this helps me a lot because you have on the one hand this um, black and white photography that's very much like a photojournalist aesthetic. Um, it's very crude, it's very ugly, right? You have the barrels, the wires, um, um, you know, the lack of hygiene, the walls and everything we tend to kind of romanticize about Beirut that's very much present versus, and, and this comes in stark contrast to um, those bodies who are sleeping in front of us, right? Um, in comics are very smooth, they're very white, they're, they're simmering in this post-sex connection. But on the other hand, they're also not there, they're comics, obviously, they're also lifeless. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is create this uh, reflection really on, you know, what would it mean if this was actually possible? You know, I, I look at this and I bristle, I'm like, wow, you know, this, this can't actually have been a, an actual photograph, right? Of just two queer people sleeping with their windows open in Jaitewe. So by the way, this is an actual uh, picture of my balcony in Jaitewe, uh, which I also reflect on in the Shta'atilik ala balkone piece. So visually, this is what I'm trying to do, you know, uh, create this, this dialogue around, you know, this imaginary, what would it mean if this was actually possible? And so the very representation of that, to me, makes it a possibility um, that we can actually imagine. But also what I'm trying to do is um, create this reflection around the gaze and labels and how limiting they are to a possible queer erotic. So you would imagine that, you know, these bodies are also kind of stuck between the gaze, you know, on one hand from this window that's wide open. So you have the overwhelmingly present neighbors that are also reflect on them and uh, you know, with the funeral scene, etc. So you have that gaze on the outside versus the gaze of you, know, you as viewer scrolling through Instagram uh, on the other side. So you'd imagine that these bodies are kind of stuck. Uh, so I had to make the, make the executive decision of um, closing the eyes of the character that you can see, whose face you can see, because I wanted her to look um, comfortable and not care enough to actually challenge the viewer. Um, as an invitation to think about, you know, who's watching who now and for what purpose? And, um, and so can we reflect on this gaze that of, you know, people on Instagram, of Instagram as a platform itself, but also societies and families. So I think that this uh, text very much um, represents all my, um, all the factors that came into my decision to leave Lebanon. Uh, so as you guys, you know, definitely know, it's illegal uh, not just to practice unnatural sex in Lebanon, but also to um, cohabit even as heterosexual couples. So if we compare that to uh, a scene uh, in the Netherlands, where I am talking to you from right now, um, you can also sense the same kind of discomfort with embodiment in space. I wanted to bring in Barid Massage a little bit to the conversation. Yes. And I wanted to read uh, the, the very beginning of a story titled Suhaqir. It's the um, very first story in the book. And um, here it is. So uh, the author writes, lesbian is such an ugly word to me. It makes me cringe, especially the French version that is more often used in Lebanon Lesbian, lesbian. <laughs> with an, yeah. or lesbian, with an elongated yen. Yeah, my alpi, yeah. Uh, oh, 
Even worse was the word dyke. But it's still all good compared to suhaqiyya. That one really makes me want to vomit. I don't know if it's the word itself or the meaning associated with it. That horrible, disgusting image of lesbians in people's minds was entrenched in my mind too for so long. Um, now she goes on and um, explains this relationship to the word and then the, the story ends with um, people give meaning to words, people can change the meaning of words or invent new words altogether or simply refuse using offensive words. We need to challenge the dictionary in our heads. I will start with myself. I am a lesbian. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm bringing this in to reflect on um, the term dyke, right? Because um, I'm, 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 we were talking before you joined us about the importance of language. And we're thinking about the terms, the languages available to us to describe all the genders and sexualities out there. So what has been your relationship to that word, which is now right there on your Instagram page? This is who you are. Um, and how do you, um, how, has, how has your experience with language between Arabic and English been? OK. Uh, I, I remember this text and I, it's funny, I actually wrote a paper that included a reflection on this text and I'm very happy that you uh, zoomed in on it because I, I think it's so important. It very well shows those generational differences. Like today, the word sohaki for me, we've completely reclaimed it, right? It's right there in downtown Beirut, everywhere. I, I only got to see pictures of it, but I can imagine how empowering it is to actually just see that. Um, for me, I, two things went into this decision. Um, first, when I created the page, I did identify as a lesbian, which I don't anymore. I did identify as a dyke, which I don't anymore, but I kept it um, for all sorts of reasons. First, you know, marketing wise, it makes no sense to change it, but um, I was very much influenced by Alison's Beck, Alison Bechtel's um, dykes to watch out for first. Um, the essential dikes to watch out for, which is basically kind of like a, a chronicle she published in a magazine first and then as a book, um, but you know, also daily experiences within the communities there. In the you US. Know. Yeah. Mm. Um, so that's my, you know, the, the first ring that came with that word. Uh, the second one was obviously the page is echoing the local rental bike company, Beirut by Bike. And uh, for me, you know, the very page holds this promise of, um, you know, taking the audience through the city, but this time through the eyes of um, someone who was queer, right? So this is where, for me, it came from. Um, in terms of language, I, it is only with time that I realized how very limiting it is. And I think this also, this text in includes within it a reflection on those Western concepts, right? And how sometimes they don't fit our own identifications, but which we kind of like uh, inherit or take in because they're really the only things that we have. Um, so right now there are super cool efforts, you know, being done with, with the gender, things like that, that are kind of like reappropriating um, terms around sexuality or creating them really um, in Arabic. Uh, in my experience, I have, I have funny, and I've said this in one of my, one of my talks, I have funny, um, Relationship with language, um, my father and mother are both literary enthusiasts and my father is very much about, you know, Adab al-Arabi and my mother is like, you know, la langue française. And so like, English for me was one my way of, you know, <laughs> doing my own thing and, and appropriating it. Um, and it's only recently, honestly, that I've been um, getting more in touch with the Arabic language. So I had to submit recently a story on, um, I had to translate actually the story I told about my grandmother's funeral to Arabic. And it made me realize um, just, you know, how many things I noticed only because I was speaking now in Arabic. And suddenly, you know, I, have, I had access to all these stories that I really didn't think about before. So I think it's a great exercise to be thinking about rethinking about sexuality in Arabic and what I'm trying to do and it is a practice to kind of create these new associations so that's why sometimes you'll see me posting um, visuals of sex stories 
uh, with, you know, um, Arabic inscriptions or whatever, using humor or not, because I'm trying to break those associations between Arabic as uh, some kind, you know, belonging to a culture of oppression or, you know, as a language that can't be sexy or what have you. So I'm kind of breaking these associations, you know, words like kiss that, you know, we've kind of given these negative associations um, too, I'm trying to break that also, but it's a practice and it definitely should be a collective effort. Um, <clears throat> so to, because you said, I mean, it's interesting that you say, you know, you used to uh, identify as a lesbian, you used to identify as a dyke, this has changed. So clearly um, you're trying to say something about how identities are not necessarily fixed and they may be and they may change over time. And I guess this is um, probably what, what your experience has been. Um, how would you identify today? Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and today I'm much more comfortable in not knowing, you know? Uh, so for me, I mean, what I would want from the world is to completely abolish gender gap. And, um, you know, because suddenly there are so many possibilities, right? Uh, when I found out that, hey, you know, I don't have to always be a woman or uh, that doesn't necessarily mean I identify as a man. Um, and that could be both or none at the same time that completely opened uh, possibilities for me. And I think language is very important because obviously it categorizes our thoughts, right? Um, and our perceptions and everything. So, yeah, I think that, um, you know, there are so many, um, it would be so much more inclusive, I think, of experiences and um, fluid experiences if we just dropped language around gender. <laughs> uh, it would be a much safer world, I think, for everyone. So, so basically, I mean, basically, we were talking about uh, how the term queer was reclaimed. Um, yeah. So basically, yes, okay, labels are restrictive, they may be oppressive, language, as we were saying before, uh, it's all, is always fallible, it will never be able to capture uh, reality, it will never be transparent, um, it will always leave things out. This is the difference between, you know, reality and representation and language. Yeah. Uh, that said, um, there is an importance in reclaiming and resignifying certain words. So, so uh, you know, the idea of uh, before we even talk maybe about what kind of representations you put out there, maybe the idea of putting that, using that word to refer to yourself is already reversing the power of the other to use it to put you down. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is where it gets tricky, right? Because on one hand, you want people to have the freedom to refer to themselves using whatever language they want. On the other hand, it is the very creation of those categories that in real life, in policy, physically, um, does reinforce and maintain um, the violence that's done against um, all sorts of bodies, right? At the intersections of race, class, gender, ethnicity, identity, et cetera. So for me, you know, on one hand, yes, I do understand um, how having terms like, um, oh, I don't know, calling someone a transgender woman instead of just referring to her as the woman she is, uh, can be validating in that it does accentuate the specific struggles that a transgender woman will be experiencing, right? On the other hand, it becomes very problematic if we, um, and Judith Butler talks about this, right? It becomes very problematic then if the object of our feminism is women, um, right? Because then it's perpetuating again the same categories that have been made to exist in the outside world. And it's again shaping our um, internal world um, based on the societal standards. So this is where it gets tricky for me. And that's why for me, um, it is not, a, you know, I find that abolishing gender categories um, in language, but also therefore everything that comes with that, right? And all sorts of systems that have been maintained would be actually very freeing and much less oppressive than creating different categories for different people. Mm. Does that make sense? 
So basically, just to uh, to maybe add to this, you're saying, you know, if we are, if we think gender is a construct and it's used as in its binary understanding to confine us into specific rigid categories, um, when we use terms like man and woman, even though, you know, it's, it's, we are sort of forced to, to use them. We are reinforcing um, these binary, maybe that are these binaries that are created uh, by language. Yeah. Um, so this is, I guess, this is where um, you know the visual component of your work is uh, uh, becomes uh, interesting to think of because um, this is what allows you to transcend language, right? Uh, transcend language in the sense of transcending English and Arabic, which both feature in your work and you use them, uh, um, you, you use them in different ways. Um, and to transcend language as language as the thing that constricts our thought, right? When you render things visually. So can you say maybe a little bit about how visual, how you, you and comics, the comic is maybe one form, but I don't think it summarizes what you do yeah. or you did justice. Uh, so when I'm drawing a comic, I have to make all sorts of decisions, right? Who are the characters? How are they represented? Um, you know, the composition, where are the characters? Um, how's the space that they are in? So there's this concept we call world building in comics, right? Uh, what's around those characters? Uh, will I show the tissues? Will I show sex toys? Um, what posters do they have around? So those objects that are um, uh, present around them and the space in which they are and how they are looking at the viewer or tells a story, right? And it is that. And, and I found sometimes that, um, so you know very well, for example, that I talk a lot about trauma. Um, so a lot of the times I would draw some, start drawing something without completely having the concept yet. I don't know what the characters are going to say, uh, but I have a general idea about where I want this to go. And it is a very process of drawing uh, that sometimes have has you know um, you know triggered this light bulb in my head, and I start realizing that oh you know I haven't uh, thought about this or I haven't dealt with this, uh, whether it's a traumatic memory or whether it's some kind of whatever kind of uh, insight that I gain. So in that sense, yes, uh, it does transcend language because I think that you know language also shapes our memories. So when I'm starting to visually represent something and those decisions that I make. Sometimes they tell me something about myself that I haven't realized. So it's not like, oh, I decide everything and you know, it comes out. So I don't know if this answers your question, but yes, visually sometimes just the act of thinking about all these things and what they mean and therefore the message that they're gonna say makes me realize something and I start processing it. And then that changes how I want to represent it then. So it's this constant um, back and forth really between the process and the concept. And can you say, um, because we're on the topic of visuals, so you use illustrations to illustrate what you probably otherwise can't render in more uh, uh, in, in photographic form, for instance, yeah. right? I, I mean, this is one of the uh, um, distinctive things about Beirut by Dyke is that it, it is not afraid of illustrating what we consider usually taboos or things that are not usually represented and it could be seen as offering sexually explicit material. Um, so is this, I mean, would you characterize your content as sexually explicit? Um, and how did you navigate this, um, particularly when it comes to the shame and stigma around it? Okay. Um, so, um, and I know, so with Sarah and I talked about this, uh, FYI, uh, so we had to also make executive decisions about what to include in, uh, in the slides that you guys got. And, um, and we had, we decided to censor about two scenes because um, they faced the risk of being construed as a bit too explicit, right? Especially in an academic setting in Lebanon and, you know, all the institutional consequences that this might uh, entail. Um, which for me is the very problem that we're dealing with, right? Um, so wh why is that a problem? Because I think that, you know, whenever anyone is kind of challenging this gender binary, they are constantly probed and questioned about, 
why they're doing that, right? Why are you deciding to show nipples here? Or, um, you know, how does nudity fit into your feminism? So they're constantly questioned and that very questioning uh, construes this act as some kind of act of opposition, but we never question the system. And why is it that is, why is it a big deal to show bodies, you know? So for me, the very um, act of showing bodies, nudities, um, sexualities in different forms or how I experience them is itself a process of decolonizing, right? Um, my own body. Um, and it's also, and I can't tell you what motivates me to do that because it changes, right? So sometimes it's for aesthetic, sometimes it's for political reasons, reason, sometimes it's for a personal reason that's more cathartic, has to do with healing or whatever. But the point is what I'm trying to do on the page is also normalize uh, sexuality and nudity because where are these things featured anyway, usually, right? You have one, the porn industry, which I think at this point we all know, you know, how it's, um, you know, riddled with toxic masculinities and misrepresentations about sex. So for me, having those comics is also a way of showing, um, you know, different facets of sex, right, that aren't represented. So how sometimes um, it can be disinterested or boring or painful or triggering for some people. And that's not something that um, I have seen as, as, or at least in a Lebanese setting, right? Um, so that's why I think it's very important to be doing this because it de-shames, it uh, normalizes this representation. Now for the question of how did I um, deal with the shame, it is terrifying to tell you the truth. And I think that um, for those of you following the page, I do sometimes take screenshots of the messages that I do get sent. Um, I, I, yeah, all sorts of things. I mean, some people are more creative than, <laughs> than others. But um, yes, it is something that I have to navigate. But I think, uh, you know, it never ever makes me doubt um, the importance of this. Um, so yeah, I think um, it's, it's a constant practice, this um, externalization of all the shame that we have internalized around our bodies and our own sexualities. Uh, you said pornography, because um, I'm thinking of a scenario where someone can, you know, uh, it could be a student, right? Um, they look at this and they say, uh, this is pornographic material in class, right? This can be used as a, a way to characterize this. How would you, what is the difference between what you are doing and between pornography? And and because you talked about the gaze, for whose gaze are you, are you, whose gaze do you think of when you are presenting these, these uh, illustrations or photos? Okay, um, so first I think like, there's nothing wrong with pornography, right? So someone can say, you know, this is pornographic and I say, okay, <laughs> you know, okay, and that's it, right? Um, but as for me, it's if it's pornographic versus not pornographic is not the question for me. Is it consensual? Is it hurting anyone? And that's it, right? Everything else is body, you know. Um, so it's again, it's yeah. You're talking about gazes. Then who is it usually that gets to decide whether this is okay for AUB or whether this is okay for Instagram? You know, you have um, so. It is these very authoritative bodies that I'm trying to act and I'm trying, obviously I'm, chip, I'm trying to chip away at, at those structures because it's a whole system, um, you know, system like, like, like schools, higher education or medicine, or public health or psychology and all these fields that really uh, draw contours over the body and tell you that, you know, uh, a gynecologist is an expert on your sexual health or a coiffeur is a, an expert on your hair or this person is a you know, expert on that part of your body. So what they do is really cut up your body and in a sense where you end up, uh, you know, not being the expert on your own self. And what I'm trying to do is, um, and obviously it's life's work, right? But trying to ex externalize that shame and, and redirecting that sense of control and making it very much my own. So, and I had to decide this a lot, right? So I had to think exactly like you were saying, because I'm also, I used to teach at AB. I'm probably going to teach again at some point. Um, and I made, and this is obviously a conscious decision, and I decided that, you know, whatever I'm putting out there um, is in my control because I'm deciding 
things around that and that should be okay. And I do not want to work in a place where that would not be okay. And this for me was very, very, very freeing. Um, so yeah, we can think about uh, how are these institutions drawing contours over our bodies, right? We tend to think that Instagram um, makes those decisions on removing a post or flagging it as sensitive uh, using an algorithm, whereas in fact, no, it's a team of people deciding this, right? Um, and if it's a human decision, it's a societal decision, therefore it's a political decision. And so why is it okay um, for men to show his nipples, but not for a woman to show hers? And why is it okay for a woman who's breastfeeding to show her nipples, but not a woman who's not, right? So, and so far as it is about family planning and um, marriage institution, it's okay. But if it's about your own pleasure, no, this is where we decide that we draw the line. So this is my own way of saying, no, I'm drawing the lines, right? So I decide this. Um, thank you for this uh, beautiful answer. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad this is recorded. I'm glad this is recorded. Um, did you, because I, I was away, so uh, did you want to go back to the panels or should we keep... Uh, uh, going with the questions, should we get a question from from uh, the students? Yeah? yeah, as you yeah. Do we have okay. questions from the audience? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> for, this, for me, yeah, this is like, this constantly happens, I think, um, you know, hearing, um, you know, that people who are students of my mother is like, one of the things also I have to take into consideration, right? Can I represent an experience that is my own, uh, if it's relating to family members that, you know, other people might know also. Um, so this is funny and just attests to how small Lebanon is and, and how restrictive that can be. Um, so I can't answer your question uh, because there are no prescriptions about what you can or should or should not do. Um, what I can tell you is, uh, you know, about my own experience, I definitely felt very suffocated in Lebanon and limited in uh, all sorts of possibilities. Um, but, um, and do I regret coming here? No, I'm very thankful for it. Um, is it challenging in its own way? Yes, very much so. So on one hand, you feel safer, right? Uh, in that if you do have your documents and um, the money for it, then you feel a bit safer because you have some kind of system in place, right? Um, that doesn't mean that you won't get harassed or attacked or whatever, that is definitely always there but you do feel like you're part of some system. Um, that being said, I constantly also feel alienated, right? Um, I mean, I talk about the Beirut explosion and people have, they don't know, right? They don't have the framework to understand what it means. So, I mean, you constantly have those negotiations around, um, you know, okay, so me at least, right? So I, I have uh, friends or colleagues or whatever, and, you know, we have some kind of relationship but it's just that, you know, there's nothing that will go deeper because there is no identification with someone or a community that can actually kind of understand what you're going through or what your concerns or challenges are. So I have no answer. And unfortunately, uh, as Lebanese people, we're constantly negotiating um, our futures this way. And it's very sad. And there is no right or wrong way of doing things. Uh is saying in the chat that I feel like migration is the best solution because otherwise you'd spend your whole life trying to fight the taboos here. So uh, yeah. what a bleak picture. <laughs> yeah, it's very bleak, um, honestly. Um, like on one hand, when I came here, I felt like, okay, I got so much more energy, mentally speaking, you know, I don't have to worry about electricity or water or what is, uh, you know, in my salad right now. Um, but I, you know, I also got some energy to think about Lebanon and how I want to practice my own activism to fight those taboos, even if I'm not there. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't still be in Lebanon and fight. Um, on the contrary, because on, you know, 
Okay, it's very complicated, right? Because uh, yes, it is horrible. At the same time, at least there is the option of having some kind of community or some kind of a network, right? Where you can um, talk to others who, you know, have the potential of doing things with you. You can organize, um, you ha can have support. Um, and you can have something it. like Barid Mustajan, right? I mean, this is one of the the outcomes of community that yeah, you meet exactly. together. Yes, um, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, it's funny, I've never shared this story um, and I will write about it very soon. What I can tell you at this point is that um, it wasn't a decision to come out. For me, I didn't think I was gay or, and I didn't have questioning around whether, you know, what this attraction means, is it actually attraction, a reaction friends? I knew very well that I was in love with this person. Um, but the reason why I shared it was because I was also not in the best of places myself. So that for me was uh, triggering a whole other monster that was kind of sleeping inside me. And that's why it was a bit uh, difficult. Um, and I also have talked about this in, in, um, in other talks because when I was in school, I was also queer in all uh, ways, right? I was um, in a school that was very, um, you know, elitist. Um, I happened to be there because my mom teaches there. Um, so I did feel out of place. I was the only atheist there that also made me feel out of place. I was also queer coming to terms with my sexuality, which is also another layer of being out of place. Um, so that context really um, shaped my coming out, right? But that wasn't a decision to come out. Um, I wasn't feeling very well and I had to tell someone about it. So that was, you know, my motivation. That being said, yeah, I, I mean, the whole discourse of coming out is very problematic, right? Um, because it does assume that you're in some kind of hiding in Lebanon, I think that also psychologists are, you know, they tend to be trained in Europe and um, in America and then come back and they're all about, you know, supporting their patients and coming out and that doesn't necessarily take into consideration their uh, socioeconomic reality. And yeah, I think the concept itself is very colonial, <laughs> really, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely, right? I think all people who are interested in psychology have some kind of uh, similar traits or are wanting to understand some stuff about human condition, whatever that is. Um, personally, yeah, um, I wanted to major in philosophy. Uh, I actually did a minor in philosophy as a BA student, but my main motivation back then was wanting to understand uh, things about myself that did not have to do with my sexuality. It was more of a combo, you know, very much about class and family dynamics and societal stuff. Um, but once I did study psychology, I learned nothing about sexuality because it's not included in any curriculum. And that's one of the things that is wrong with the system, right? We graduate as uh, psychologists and we're ready to practice um, knowing absolutely nothing about sexuality, which is a whole problem in itself. Um, what it did offer is this willingness to understand um, social dynamics um, and introspect more and be aware of my thoughts. I forgot that you raised your hand, so uh, 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 sorry for the delay. You have a question. Okay, so for me, I haven't yet, I might represent um, frontal nudity or anatomy or what have you, I might do that, but I haven't yet, only because, I mean, when I'm representing body, I try to remove them from the mechanics of sex. Um, so yeah, it would be cool to represent the clitoris, for example, that has been scientifically completely ignored because its only function is pleasure. Um, but the reason why I don't do that is precisely because it tends to reduce and um, 
how do you say, it? like in French, we call this metonymie. I forgot how to pronounce it in, in English, but what it does is reduce a person to a certain part of their body. Metonymy, right? metonymy. Metonymy, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Metonymize, yeah, okay. Uh, so, so that's why I haven't represented female genitalia this way. You know what I mean? Uh, but that's not because I don't want to, but because it is um, a decision to make it a part of something larger. Does that make sense to you? Um, I can't answer that um, because I have been, I was out in Beirut and I started depicting those things in Beirut. That being said, I, will, I would definitely be much more afraid if I was in Beirut, right? So for example, when there was this whole issue around Marwan Habib, uh, the serial rapist and sexual harasser, I honestly, at first, like I couldn't sleep. I was in the Netherlands, millions of miles away, but I couldn't sleep. And I would sometimes get flashes, like he's here on the streets um, coming to get me. So I was actually still afraid of exposing, even though I was not in Beirut. So I cannot imagine what would have happened if I was in Beirut or if I would have actually done this, uh, if I were. Definitely it helps with the fear, breaking the barrier of fear, um, the fact that I'm away. Um, yeah, it's interesting, you know, I don't, I would have also had the same institutional concerns Sarah would have had, that Sarah had, right, with the explicit um, material, right? Uh, if I wanted to teach in Lebanon, I would definitely have considered things very differently, you know? Um, so yeah, that definitely affects my decisions. Um, would I still have done it? I can't, no, but definitely this would sort have of raised all sorts of concerns, you know? You were talking about um, being in the Netherlands, uh, um, being in Beirut, um, the different, you know, still feeling Beirut while you're in the Netherlands, um, do you think that the meaning of your um, queer identity, um, we're using identity or queerness, since, since we, we started by, by with, a, with a cautionary tale about identities and what they can yeah. and can do. Um, does, does it mean differently to you when you're there? I mean, this, thinking here about a sense of one's gender and sexuality and how it shifts between spaces. So from Beirut to the Netherlands. Yes, it does. Uh, and it's very interesting, the stuff that came out when I came here about my sexuality. Um, first, it definitely gave me the mental space when I was here to already question. You know, if I'm at the supermarket and I see a trans woman with the armpit hair and, uh, you know, a dress and wearing makeup, that definitely opens possibilities, right? So, oh, you know, I, I could go out um, in all sorts of ways. So I have this freedom. So I start thinking, you know, would I want to, right? Or the types of events that are uh, available in Amsterdam and all sorts of things where, you know, no one really cares uh, what you look like to different degrees. Where I am is a bit like a diar, but if you go to the center, you know, it's completely different. Um, that definitely opens some possibilities because then you see, you know, if I remove the societal barrier, what would I actually want to be or to do or how do I, how would I want to wear my body? Um, and so, yes, that did open a lot of possibilities and my own questions around my own gender identity became um, just that, they became questions, you know, uh, and I was much more comfortable than not answering them or going with them and accepting that this changes with time and you know, you're not stuck in either or uh, categories. Um, in terms of, um, so that's in terms of, of, of safety, really. Um, and with, with my relation to Lebanon, I, you know, again, yes, that did give me some space to think about my own relationship with Lebanon. I've said this a lot of times also on my page that, you know, the same question with sexuality, this question of home is also just as fluid, right? In Lebanon, I also felt like I didn't fit, right? In, in any type of um, group of friends or communities or, or professional networks or whatever. I always felt like, okay, I need to be elsewhere. But, but then I realized in coming here and finding a bit more grounding just mentally, um, 
I also accepted the fact that the home is also something that changes, right? Um, across borders or, you know, it's also something that's fluid um, and it's very much a reflection of, of this inner world and how grounded that world is. Um, yeah, so I don't know if this answers your question. Um, it, it definitely does. Uh, I remember, you just mainly remember a moment when I first moved for grad school Mm. to um, to Philly and I was living uh, uh, in, a, in a you know in a hip sort of uh, part of the, the city next to the university young people queer people and I remember and I had just arrived um, and I went into this coffee shop you know vegan queer feminist coffee shop and uh, and I remember the, um, I was sitting because I didn't have internet yet. So I was sitting, um, trying to send emails and I, a, a woman walks in who looks nothing like a woman, but you know, I, it, she registered as a woman. And, yeah. um, and then the thing that I spotted most immediately is her body hair. So her legs, yeah. the hair on her legs, the hair on her armpits. And it was a moment where something Exactly. Where something shifted, where something ticked, where yeah. suddenly what is, what, what is in your line of sight, in your line of vision, what is visible to you is now has expanded. So when mm -hmm. you start seeing things that you don't see before, uh, there's mm -hmm. something in your imagination, in your consciousness um, that is awakened towards what end, it's not clear. This is how desires start to get shaped, how you know, they start to get oriented. But all yeah. this to bring this back to the notion of visibility, mm -hmm. right? talking about what you can see uh, 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 and what you can see and the importance of making these things visible. Um, these other ways of being, other ways yeah. of embodiment. And um, because you started by saying it gave you, Beirut by Dyke started as you know, a personal urge or need to say something. Um, mm -hmm and uh, uh, provided some sort of catharsis, but clearly you are making something visible for someone else. Yeah. So how, I mean, say more about this, your relationship to the public, to your audience, uh, generally speaking, the kinds of responses, when we're talking here about not the, the shitty, the positive ones. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, and, and maybe just to put, to give you the, a big question, how did you growing up also in your adulthood, where did you find, before you moved out, where, where did you see these things? What representations were available for you? Yeah. Okay, so I'll start with that. Um, so just, it's so, you're so right, right? So when you see these uh, queernesses, uh, they, they do open up a lot of possibilities and, and hence, you know, the importance of visibility. And it is true that whenever I'm, yes, I mean, I'm telling the story because it's my own, but when you tell your own story, you know, the fact that it's a story, therefore is not just uh, your own, right? It's, it's also that of the public. Um, and there's this issue of identification with the literature, et cetera. Um, so for me, I remember very distinctly, um, and I've, I've written about this, at the moment that I entered the, the space Nasawiya. Uh, so Nasawiya is, for you guys who don't know, uh, how we dare you know. not know? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, so Nasawiya was the very first uh, in space that was registered as an NGO that was for uh, and by feminists but also queer communities. And its function on paper was um, to give women um, a space that is free from sexual harassment. And it is very funny because the very first protest I ever attended um, was on that day. And so we went to this protest that was to go against the Lal Tamdid, go against the um, um, the extension of parliament whose term has had expired like eight days earlier. So we go to this protest and then we decide to go to Nasawiya um, just to have a, a, like a, like a coffee and get to know the space. And when we do go to that space, I was baffled by, um, you know, these um, queer women, queer folks, trans women um, who were there. They were all, you know, 
they had tattoos over their bodies, piercing, short hair. Uh, and for me, that was like, oh, well, like finding this world that I did not know existed. Um, the funny thing about that experience is that on that very night, my, the first uh, alternative or queer space that I did enter, uh, we were held at gunpoint by uh, the bodyguards of Nadim Jmail, who thought we were taking a pictures, pictures of their convoy. So they attacked the space. Um, and we can talk more about this later, you know, uh, <laughs> what I can only construe in retrospect as a traumatic event uh, was actually something that really cemented my need to stay with this community, right? So we had just, um, it and, and again, I was living in my own bubble of um, this fancy school that I was absolutely not political. And then my first day in this alternative space, you know, we get attacked uh, by this convoy and we have to go to Amin al-Am the next day. And for me, it was a completely different world. Um, so this for me was the first space where um, I was exposed to these communities. And, and then it continued, right? So after that, I became part of Damme, also a feminist space, right? So these spaces where I was exposed to literature, this is where I, you know, got to know Baridi Stajil and reading that. Um, very much affected everything that I'm doing right now uh, and very much shaped me also into knowing or thinking about all of these possibilities out there in terms of sex, but also in terms of um, community organizing and strategies of organizing um, and feminist values, etc. That's uh, space-wise. Uh, Literature-wise, I was definitely um, influenced by Alison Bechdel, um, also Le Petit Nicolas when I was a kid was very much, uh, you know, presence in my own childhood. I was very interested in, you know, how does this guy, Sompe, like how does he use um, super simple lines um, and use, how does he use humor to actually uh, counter the um, very disciplinary structure of this French school system. Um, whether sometimes I want to leave a story for myself and not uh, actually talk about it on Instagram, uh, because a lot of the times queer folks feel like, you know, they have to do this labor of educating other people about their own issues. Uh, so I was just saying that, you know, this is a great question. Yeah, it uh, is. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, so for me, uh, some of the posts that I do are educational in the sense that they have to do with psychoeducation, you know, uh, what are the symptoms of PTSD and how do you deal with them. Uh, but when I am talking about my stories, that's um, definitely not educational. And I have the belief that everyone's an expert on their own selves and everyone has their own stories, their own realities, etc. Um, yes, sometimes I do. So here's what happens. Sometimes I'll write a story and I'll publish it like the story about my grandmother, right? So I'll publish this story. It's a very personal one. And, and I realized like this story recently that, you know, there's a lot about it I have not yet processed, but then I, I threw it out in the public and then it's not mine anymore. And that creates its own challenges. So for example, right now I had to submit a podcast that I'll make uh, available soon. That's literally the same grandma story, but in Arabic. And if you compare, you'll definitely see that there was much more emotion in the newer one. Because I'm also kind of getting in touch with the sense of loss that before was very cerebral. I'm kind of analyzing what's happening at the funeral. Uh, it's almost an academic expose of, you know, gendered performatives around griefs or whatever, grief. Um, but then I never say how I'm feeling. Um, so sometimes I'll share a story, I haven't processed it yet, and then I'll process it, and then I would tell it differently. And sometimes I'll also tell a story reflecting on the very fact uh, that it's very hard to tell the story. Like I told the story about, for example, the genre of the testimony, right? So how do you tell the tes testimony around sexual assault, for example, and the difficulties of that? Um, and there are stories I have not yet told <laughs> that I am keeping for later because of it, like because also I haven't processed them still. So the process itself is sometimes very cathartic and sometimes very triggering, uh, but it's that process itself that is part of you know the larger labor of healing from all the um, 
social instructions uh, that we have to deal with, right? Um, as people who don't necessarily fit the gendered systems around us. Yeah. Because you're, you're now talking about stories. Um, mm -hmm. When we, we say stories as if the stories are, you know, they're here and you're just retrieving them, right? From your, yeah, exactly, exactly. From your memory. And there's one story, two stories, three stories. Exactly. And it's, you know, story, storytelling is about, you know, taking experience and turning it into a story, right? So there's a lot of experience, a lived experience that gets transformed then into a story that we can tell and that someone can receive and maybe retell. Yeah. So, um, so this idea of experience, of personal experience is something that has been, and the sharing of personal experience is something that has been um, very important in the development of a sort of collective, both queer and feminist consciousness um, mm -hmm. in Lebanon. Um, and so Beirut by Dyke maybe is one place where we see uh, uh, this happening again, but to, to sort of tie it back to the previous question uh, whose answer I didn't get to hear about what this does to you, so the sharing of personal experience, the relationship to the public, how mm -hmm. they uh, respond. Um, and I'm thinking of this, the possibility for identification or relatability, because again, one of the, in, in the stories of Barid Mastajil, um, mm -hmm. the internet appears as, you know, the, the oasis in the desert. Suddenly, you, you, you know, there's a story about this woman who, as soon as her father gets her an internet uh, dial-up connection, the first thing she Googles is uh, lesbians. <laughs> yeah. So um, maybe I'm circling around this, but uh, what, does it, what does the sharing of personal experience um, do to... Um, in terms of creating a sense of community. And, and here maybe, because you mentioned these spaces that you were part of, maybe mm -hmm. just to, re, to, to think again about this issue. Yeah. So projects like Beirut, Beirut um, Mustajil, um, were very inspirational because they also broke some kind of fear, barrier of fear. I mean, itself, it's brilliant as a collective project because it very much performs this need to, you know, collectively speak up or talk about our realities or what have you. So, you know, me reading this, um, I was, you know, stuff were already simmering in my head of, oh, you know, this counts as, you know, an experience that needs to be told and it has certain ramifications if it is told. I personally, um, identified with some of the stories or some aspects of the stories there. Um, my exposure to these alternative spaces who were in themselves uh, engaging in all sorts of collective efforts, whether that's around storytelling or uh, the curation of certain cultural events or humanitarian initiatives or uh, whatever intersectional initiatives they were actually doing, um, this very much informed kind of the strategies I was using on my page. Um, in terms of stories, I think, you know, the helpful part for me um, is when I'm telling the story, for example, around the funeral or the supermarket, it has become, because it's coming from the space of, I think that I am alone in this experience. Whereas, you know, when I'm telling it as a story and people comment, you know, on the comment or they share or they say, you know, what, what this triggered in them or and this, this very act of interacting with the story, which a platform like Instagram um, makes very possible and, and in fact demands of you as a user, um, is in itself this, uh, it's kind of making this less of a lonely experience. So, and what it does is, so when I, I don't know, for example, I'll tell the story about the funeral. Someone will say, oh my God, the same thing happened with me. I was there and this guy thought I was a dude. He shook my hand and then it turns out, you know, um, haram or whatever, they shouldn't do this. Um, so that process um, for me, from, I mean, from what people also tell me is that it also breaks their fear, um, you know, of listening that 
recognizing themselves in the story um, makes them reflect on their own experiences at the funeral, in the church, in a family gathering, around the dinner table, whatever. So they start reflecting on their own experiences. And I think it is that collective recognition and the very reflecting reflection on it publicly that is kind of helping us chip away at whatever oppressive structures surround us. Do you get tired, the thing I want now is, do you get tired of people wanting to ask you about, about this or telling you their experience? I mean, how many, how many stories can you hear? So does this tire you or are you still, do you still find? No, it, no not at all. Yeah. It's very validating, in fact, you know, when you hear, and, oh, you know, I'm not the only crazy person who is kind of super anxious at the supermarket. You know, this for me is like, ah, you know, so it just also reinforces me, uh, reinforces me, but it also uh, validates other people. So it's very much this validation that is, you know, uh, keeping up, you know. Um, yes, I will not lie. Sometimes I do get tired because a lot of people, because of what this page also sometimes does, um, I just, you know, someone that I don't know will t tell me, you know, a very huge triggering story. Um, And I had to uh, make the conscious, conscious decision of saying, okay, I can't, uh, and I get a lot of those. Mm. And sometimes I'll just refer them to resources. Sometimes I have the energy to validate and talk. Um, and sometimes I can't be. Uh, so I have to, depending on my energy on that day, I have to make those uh, calculations. So I, I want to conclude by saying that, because um, you know, as, as I was preparing for this, thinking about what kind you know what is Beirut by die right it's 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 really hard to just say it's this or that it's so many different things as I mean and I'm saying as as a page as yeah. this, this this object that exists in the world the virtual object so it does many things and I think the only way um to really understand is by navigating it and looking at the different things that it is doing Um, and one thing is for sure is that it's it's bringing in, I mean, so much of what you're sharing now about your background. So it's not just about sexual orientation or sense of gendered self. It's also about mental health. It's also mm -hmm. about psychology. Uh, it's also about, I mean, illustration and, and visual arts. So it's like you found such a nice, beautiful, creative way of bringing all of these Uh, uh, aspects of who you are into this page and um, as an educator and I will speak here as an educator uh, I would like to thank you in front of the students um, for 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 making this material available for us for sharing uh, you're not just sharing stories you're curating content and I know we discussed all the functions and uses of what you're doing and whether on a personal or public level but as teachers of sex and gender uh, in Lebanon in the region uh, we would be much more impoverished if we didn't have Beirut by Dyke to uh, teach. That is a huge compliment. Thank, uh, really thank you so much. Uh, so I this. wanted I wanted to make sure that um, you know we think of it also as a pedagogical tool um, and uh, um, And it is definitely a, a big one. So uh, thank you, Sinin, so much for giving us the time. Uh, for creating the space for this discussion. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, the, the students uh, have to, uh, their final assignment is actually a response that engages with Beirut Baidaik and Berid Mustajil. Um, so I'm very excited to read this. Uh, Maybe I'll, you know, I don't know, we'll, I'll get permission, but uh, we'll see if we can share them with you as well so that you can get a sense of, anonymously, of course, no one's name <laughs> will be revealed. Um, but so, yeah, that's it.